Hey, what's up everyone? Manesh, the psychedelic scientist here. Welcome to my channel where I provide easy to understand but non-superficial discussions of the latest in psychedelic science. In today's video, I'm going to be diving into the relaxed beliefs under psychedelics or Rebus unified model of how psychedelics work. So a couple of videos back, I described the entropic brain hypothesis of how psychedelics work. And now the Rebus model builds on and expands upon this model and combines it with something called hierarchical predictive coding, which is a particular approach or perspective to understanding how the brain works. In essence, in non-technical terms, the Rebus model proposes that psychedelics, by making the brain more entropic in its activity, reduces the stability and rigidity of our beliefs and models and assumptions about who we are and how the world works, opens us up to new information that we were previously ignoring or explaining away, and gives us a window of opportunity to revise or update our beliefs in more positive and life-affirming ways, if done with the right preparation and in the right context and so on. And so in what follows, I'm going to unpack what exactly that means and dive into the specifics of this model. Along the way, I'll be providing relevant background information, but I highly recommend you watch my video on the entropic brain hypothesis if you haven't already. So the Rebus model is both a psychological and brain theory of how psychedelics work. So in this video, I'm going to start off by describing the psychological side and then move into how it might work in the brain afterwards. So a core idea underpinning the Rebus model is that we experience and navigate the world through our beliefs and assumptions of how it is and who we are. These beliefs and assumptions essentially function as lenses or filters through which we collapse the crazy chaos and information overload of life into something that's manageable. On an impersonal level, these beliefs can include the belief that walls are solid and don't generally move, that the sky is blue, that we live in a world of space and time and causality, that we can put our hands into running water without hitting something solid, that in general things will obey the laws of physics as we understand it, things will fall if we drop them, etc. So these are just impersonal beliefs about how the world works which guide our perception. And then there are also personal beliefs. So the belief that the world is a safe or unsafe place, that we are worthy or unworthy of love, that we are competent, that other people can be trusted, that we can attain great success and happiness in our life, and all these beliefs as well contextualize, filter, and alter how we perceive the world. And as you might guess, these beliefs can vary widely in how accurate they are, how healthy they are, and how much they infirm positive behaviors and actions in our life. As an easy example, we can think of somebody who suffers from depression, who might see the world in a very negatively biased, cynical, and nihilistic light. Or another example are cases in which people live within an echo chamber that emphasizes a particular belief or perspective on the world and they get so consumed by it that they lose touch of what actually is going on in reality. Flat earthers, I might be kind of talking about you. But of course, there's so many examples these days. So what's important to recognize is that these beliefs are essential for us to navigate the world. As I mentioned, they give us a sense of stability and certainty. They ground us in a sense of knowing or feeling like we know what's going to happen and what our life situation is like and what we can expect in the world and all of the rest. As humans, we need that. We need that sense of security and groundedness. Otherwise, we live in a state of perpetual chaos where anything can happen at any moment. But at the same time, by having certainty and by having beliefs and assumptions about the world, we're, again, constraining our experience and closing ourselves off to things that are outside of that perspective. As an easy example, a person who's depressed, again, might have this negatively biased view that blocks them from seeing the various successes in life and from remembering or noticing their positive interaction. Or for example, we might be somebody who just assumes that crippling anxiety is a normal and unavoidable aspect of life. And this might lead us to not really explore what might be giving rise to that anxiety and inhibit our ability to work through it and overcome it. So in this way, our beliefs and assumptions are kind of like a double-edged sword. Yes, they give us this stability and security, but depending on how healthy they are, they might keep us in very limiting and negative patterns. And so again, the core idea of the Rebus model is that psychedelics, through their effects on the brain, reduce our sense of confidence in our beliefs, or in other words, make them more flexible and malleable. And that is, in turn, opens us up to information we had previously been ignoring or explaining away, either from our senses, from the external world, or from our internal world, from our memories. And so in this way, psychedelics can lead us to remember memories we had long forgotten, give us a new perspective on our current situation, allow us insight into our patterns, 
and more generally allow us to realize, integrate, and overcome unconscious tendencies that are having a negative impact on our life. And it's in this way the Rebus model proposes that psychedelics can lead to personal transformation, healing, and behavior change. Alright, so that was an overview of the psychological side of the Rebus model. Now let's dive into how this might be working in the brain in a bit more detail. Alright, so first, as I mentioned, I'm going to provide some essential background. I'm going to first quickly go over the entropic brain hypothesis and then describe a little bit about hierarchical predictive coding accounts of brain function. So the entropic brain hypothesis hinges on the idea that psychedelics make the brain more entropic in its activity. Other words for entropic include disordered, chaotic, or unpredictable. And by putting the brain in this entropic state, the idea is that psychedelics move us from a state of consciousness that is analytical, rational, reasonable, and reflective into a state that is more unconstrained, uh, illogical, full of contradictions, more visual and imagistic, and hyper-associative in character. And the idea that you might guess is that the second state of consciousness, which is referred to as primary consciousness, is the state that encompasses the psychedelic experience, but also other altered states of consciousness, such as those induced by breath work, fasting, sensory deprivation, and a whole variety of techniques. So that's the entropic brain hypothesis in a nutshell. Now, hierarchical predictive coding is a fascinating leading perspective on brain function, which provides a brain description of how we live in the world through our internal models and beliefs and assumptions. Essentially, it proposes that our model of the world, or our high-level beliefs about how things are, are encoded in a hierarchy of brain regions. So at the lower ends of the hierarchy, we get sensory regions. So these are regions which just take raw inputs from the external world, from our eyes, from our ears, from our sense of touch, and process those. So it's just sensory processing. And at the other end of the hierarchy, at the higher end, is the default mode network, which encodes high-level abstract conceptual belief. So you can see how it goes from just processing the external world to our beliefs, which are much more abstract in general and which encompass a lot of the bare inputs we're getting. And also within these perspectives on brain function is the idea that the regions at the higher level in the hierarchy in some sense control or modulate and highly influence the ones lower in the hierarchy. So in this case, we can say our abstract conceptual beliefs encoded by our default mode network feed down in the hierarchy and alter our perception, which in terms of the brain means they modulate the activity in sensory areas. And so when the Rebus model talks about our high level beliefs informing and modulating and directing our experience of the world, it's actually talking about the default mode network modulating and altering the activity of regions lower in the hierarchy. All right, so let's summarize this and bring it all together in terms of the brain. So remember that the Rebus model emphasizes how psychedelics affect our most fundamental beliefs about how the world works and who we are. And that, as I just mentioned, these beliefs seem to be encoded by the default mode network. And so if we speak more specifically, the Rebus model proposes that psychedelics, by altering the activity at serotonin 2A receptors, which are most located within the default mode network, makes the default mode network more entropic and unstable in its activity. And that now that it's more entropic and unstable, it's constraining lower levels in the hierarchy less. So what this means is that now sensory areas and memory areas which were below the default mode network have more space to be setting up information that previously was being ignored or explained away by our belief. And also this model proposes that during this process, the default mode network becomes more sensitive to this information and is more able to be changed in a lasting way. And actually, in a paper that I submitted to a journal, which is currently under review, we provided evidence for the idea that the default mode network actually becomes less differentiated from lower levels in the hierarchy. In some sense, the hierarchy is flattened or blurred under psychedelics. And this might lead to a blurring of our abstract concepts with our immediate sense perception. So, on the whole, when the default mode network becomes more unstable and untropic, and sensory and lower level areas have more space to do things, we're able to receive and acknowledge information that previously we've been ignoring, which can then alter our high level belief. And then after the experience with the right integration and the right effort, we can perhaps encode these new beliefs and change models of the world in a lasting way for a lasting positive benefit in our lives. Again, I just want to emphasize that all this assumes that you approach the psychedelic experience with the right preparation and did it in the right context and had a plan for integration. 
All that is essential in order to really use the opportunity that psychedelics give you. All right, so that's mainly it that I wanted to describe in this video. I hope it was clear. If anything was unclear, please write it in the comments below and I'll get back to you pretty quick. And also let me know if there's any specific topic I talked about in this video in passing that you want me to go into in more detail. Lastly, I also want to remind all of us that this is just a model or theory of how psychedelics work. There are a lot of things in this model that are not yet definitively confirmed or supported by research. The best way perhaps to think of this model is as an interesting theory that can motivate future studies and allow us to really find out what's going on. It's by no means the end-all be-all of how psychedelics work. And with that, again, leave a comment below, let me know what you thought, hit that like button and show me some love, and subscribe if you haven't already for more videos on the latest in psychedelic science.